I'm going to be reflecting on an intellectual journey. So some of the ideas that you hear are still not yet well formed. Um, but they might make sense. Uh, the, I just want to explain the title after theory, part theory, by which I simply mean after theory for the sake of theory. Uh, in part because I'm worried about the direction that uh, uh, not just uh, science, technology, and society, but also uh, mobility studies is taking in mind to take. It's, some projects start, start out with a lot of politics, fire in their belly, and then they just, you know, very politically engaged, socially engaged, then they just fizzle out into, uh, you know, a kind of jewel, a jumping and weaving of the concepts. Uh, so, if you are looking for theory in my work, it's only by accident. Uh, my interest in mobility comes from at least three, if not four, trends that are very pertinent to uh, everyday life in Africa. The most fundamental is the trade in Africa with slaves. I do not call it slave trade. Uh, and one of the things that I'm looking for in that is not just the stories of pain, but also how do you recover uh, a humanity made possible by what I call creative resilience, where even where death is certain and people's back, backs are against the wall. Uh, people just don't die the whole of them, they die fighting. And that's to me the story of slavery. It's a story in which Africans become um, without uh, volunteering abducted and shipped overseas because they are not just going to be used uh, as the first instruments of mass production, but are also systematically recruited because, you know, abducted because they know. I'm talking of masons, rice growers, talking about iron smiths mm. who go on to be the foundation stone of foundries in Virginia, in British Guyana, in Jamaica. I'm talking about masons who would go on to construct some of the most monumental buildings in the United States, including the White House. So then, to the story of slavery, is an account of Africans is one of those examples of systematic technology transfer, even under the US. So that's the first point of intervention. The second one is, so slavery becomes very expensive. We, steam mills are also being uh, invented. Um, enslaved Africans to the enterprise of the plantation are increasingly becoming a very costly and necessity. The option now is to enslave Africans and source. Hence the end to exploit the untapped and tipped minerals of Africa and the rich soils. And so we are seeing the systematic colonization of Africa and the transformation of African into slave labor in Africa. Now, in my latest book, which I will talk about shortly, I dismiss the notion that 
ordinary Africans use the term colonized, colonized, or we are colonized. They talked about it in the Zimbabwean context at least, as slavery, as theft, barbarity, robbery, rape, abduction, both of wealth and the soil, and abduction of the money. And the coming of the uh, of the European, the men without legs, so called, because they said, because they wore trousers, so they thought they didn't have enemies. And see uh, the term "vasinama," uh, those without. Those. It's it initially welcomed. Then they betray locals. They that have taught them to hunt, to trade that have given them space to preach their gospel and then they colonized um, the betrayal of trust. That journey results in, for many African leaders, in chains. Um, and so we come to this phase where how do you imagine a humanity in chains? And if you look at the Biblical link between slavery in the Americas and slavery at home. It kind of makes sense. So that's the second stage the transformation of Africans as tools of uh, extraction. But again, as you will see for the rest of my talk, I do not write narratives of simply weeping and feeling sorry. I write narratives of people who innovate under impossible words. So now we come to Amy Cizé. Amy Cizé introduces to us the concept of thingification. <coughs> thingification is an interesting concept. It's the transformation of black humanity into tools, into things like stones. <coughs> Think people who don't think. It's no longer just dehumanization. It's de-intellectualization. <clears throat> the incapacity and impossibility to think. Perhaps the marker of the savage. And what ABC does, not just him, the whole movement called Negritude including founding president of Senegal, uh, Leopold Seda Senga, Leon Damas, uh, David Job, and several others. The move they make is to take, because the whole basis behind the enslavement of the African. This had been a big conversation between the priest De Las Casas and his uh, contemporaries that the black man has no soul. The Native American has some kind of soul. So instead of, color, of uh, uh, enslaving the, uh, the, 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 the Native American, you might better yet just enslave the black person because there's no soul. Hence, W. Du Bois retort in that seminal book, The Soul of Platform. Anyway, I digress. Amy Cizé comes in with the negligent movement to take that which among our white folk constituted the marker of the savage, the marker of the unhuman, the non-human and turns it into the rock, the cornerstone of black pride. <clears throat> that move is significant because it's also made within the diaspora, uh, particularly in France. But mind you, this is in conversation with the Harlem Renaissance in New York, the likes of Langston Hughes and others. It's also in conversation later on with people like Kwame Krum 
before then Marcus died. The guy looked like what? Now, I told you that I do not believe in soft stories when I'm writing history, my history, the history of my ancestors. The foundations laid by those like Amy Cizé, Du Bois, Pan Africanism, who is what later generations fighting for independence would build on. This is a picture taken in the 1970s in Zimbabwe, where at that time a young man was uh, five years old, six years old, and in this countryside. I was talking to Ibra about this period. Cizé had talked about the idea of African knowledge production and African humanity based on communality of purpose. Had rejected Marx because Marx, he said, started with the individual who collected vices. Whereas Africans started from the communal. And the individual could only be, as in being, could only be because of and among and within the communal. The work that I'm doing now on Chimrenga, the war of liberation in Zimbabwe, posits liberation movements in Guinea-Bissau, in Algeria, in Mozambique, Zimbabwe, South Africa, Namibia, Angola, uh, from 1960, let's say from 50s, if you include Algeria, as communal efforts. And they reposition the war zone as perhaps the most amazing feat of African creativity and creative resilience ever seen in recent memory. The tragedy of it is that African scholars do not write it as such. We write it as narratives of great leaders, great battles. We need to return it to the people who were on the ground fighting. The people. The majority of the people. This picture is iconic for me because it shows two frontline leaders in the war of liberation. My father had left for the, for the city because they were being victimized. He was the chairperson of, uh, you know, uh, one of the guerrilla movements. And all guerrillas coming into uh, the area where we lived deployed and first headed to uh, our home. Why? For two reasons. Logistically, to get directions from my dad on where to go, where to base, who to see, what kind of young people, boys and girls, to liaise with because this would be the uh, intelligence uh, people, intelligence operatives, sending messages. Because after all, guerrillas don't operate with two-way frequency radios. The frequency radio of the guerrilla is the young people. And so my father had to go to the city. The second reason why they deployed our area was precisely because my mother was a spirit medium. Enter into the conversation what to do with the question of the spiritual in African writing. A lot, of, a lot of what I see about writing in Africa and the question of the spiritual does not impress me precisely because what do you do with that as a space, as an archive, as a source, as a force? Anyway, they would deploy to our area. My mother would be in a moment of possession, would relay what to do with uh, the spiritual realm because the guerrillas in Zimbabwe never fought outside the spiritual realm. Another way of putting it, if you don't believe in the spiritual, is that spirit mediums were the best intelligence source. After all, it's to whom people, the mortals, relate all their problems. Mm -hmm. So, who could be a better intelligence officer than my mom? This is not my mom. This is 
the Zimbabwean woman at that time. Um, the other thing that was going on was that all the uh, hammer mills, you know, working on petrol or diesel, had been shut down or destroyed during the war. So in the countryside, in the whole countryside, people had to defer back to those modes of a, a, a food processing post-harvest technologies that they had long used. They were still using them. It's not as if they were more advanced. They were still using them, but for smaller grains, like the grinding stone and the smaller grinder, like the winnowing basket, and so on and so forth. So I raise this issue precisely because this is where my education as a scholar not only began, but has long since gone back, but never left. A kind of consciousness that my knowledge counts for something. It's not primitive, it's not pre-modern. It is simply knowledge. It's not ethno knowledge. It's knowledge because all knowledge is ethno. There's <laughs> <laughs> no golden reason why mind should be relegated to some stuff. So it's one of the reasons why which 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 motivate me. But precisely because my journey to the United States began when I began to question. I had studied my PhD in Vitz. I was about to start writing my PhD uh, thesis after my prospectors had been approved. But it was all Marxist scholarship. And I told myself, hey, Marx was not African. Last time I checked, the negligent fathers, like they say, later on, for now, and to a point to a person, Nyerere, Nyerere, Nkrumah, Sekuture, uh, everybody had questioned the, the Marxist approach, saying that Marx had never governed the country. Marx had never fought a guerrilla war. What pronouncements would he make to the African situation? Every theory had to be filtered through the needs of the African designer shaping his own destination or her own destination. And the whole idea was that all of these were resources at best, and to be quite frank, raw materials for the African designer shaping their own destiny. And so that dissatisfaction led me to the question. Africa is not mentioned in technological or scientific terms. There's this big debate that was going on dismissing J. Gunner Dupes, the African origin of civilization. Why is it that Africa is not referred to in those scientific and technological terms? So I wanted to start this. It's how my journey into science and technology studies began. When the opportunity came for me to join a proper history department, I refused to go to Duke, precisely because I needed a space where Africa could be accounted for from a very different place. What better than in the belly of the beast of science and technology? So these are political investments that I have. Um, and for me, the first stage was to construct a vocabulary. And that's what I tried to do in the first chapter of my first book, Transit Experiences. Basically to say that perhaps there's a way in which I don't like mobility studies. It is too technocentric. It is no too Western-centric. It is too gridded. I don't operate in grids. I've never, I never have. There has to be escape routes, alleyways, possible entry points. There's no reason why this should be the, 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 the proper one. Even mice, they're very different caverns. I dug mice when I was growing up. Very different caverns. 
You think it's going to come back through this way? No, it is. A, a mouse always has an escape route. So does the cricket. I dug in at both. No, it's not because of hunger. It's because there are geographies of edibility across the world. We don't eat the same thing. Anyway, I'm just responding to CNN because they thought that Zimbabwe are so desperate that they now eat rats. <laughs> Mice, not rats. So part of this was to try and reconstruct a world. A world in which I could not find resources to write African policies in the way I wanted to. And the only way I could do it was to go to my village, to elders, to go back to knowledge that we had just been sidled as literature, proverbs, riddles, poetry, sculpture, etc., etc., etc. And in these, I was trying to roll back and say, I want to understand how this became something. When you hear the word poetry in motion, it's probably because there is, mo there is motion in poetry. There's a reason why. So it's to these registers that I intend. And to go back and actually retrace the steps which I had walked as a boy, this time with a consciousness that what was called the technological in the Roman Empire, long before the word technology was being used in the way that it's now used since the 1860s, was almost exactly the exact same thing that was being rejected in Africa as untechnological. And I was saying, I'm going to call it as such, because if what we mean is means and ways of doing things, fit for purpose. And so that's when I started really thinking seriously about mobility as an archive, as a process, ways in which my own ancestors have understood what mobility is. As a rule, they believe that all mobility Whatever we do, including mobilities of insects, of animals, of trees growing up or not growing, is never happenstance. It's spiritually guided ability. So I was rehabilitating the person of the spiritual. The second step that I took was to assemble scholarship that could speak to these issues on an Africa-wide scale. Um, and that was the volume that came out last year. This, the latest book that <coughs> is about to come out on June 14, or returns both to my dissertation titles, only that part. Uh, and to, it's a product of 20 years of research, 15 chapters. Uh, it's the most, you know, energy saving project I've ever worked on, which I may not repeat. <laughs> um, I was trying to account for you have this whole human land you you have the violence that it causes without us being aware that they are moral persons. When we talk about moral persons here usually it's bioethics. And no it's not talking about moral questions around ethics. It's talking about the do's and don'ts as listed on the IRB. I was not interested in that question. What I took interest in is how is it that Africans were able to read the mobilities of this tiny insect in such a way that they would craft ways to avoid it, mm -hmm. to cheat it, mm -hmm. and but not kill it. Sorry. This notion that we have to kill our way to the future, mm -hmm. uh, to kill our way to the healthy environment, sounds a bit crazy. Mm -hmm. And the result was, you know, the mobile workshop. The mobile workshop, the character of the mobile workshop is the insect itself. 
and how it, it, the knowledge gathered, produced, stolen, built upon, in order to deal with this pestiferous, very pathetic insult. And so I felt at that time what I wanted to do was to restore moral questions around the mobility of knowledge, theft mm -hmm. of knowledge, if you want, from Africans into European science. And again, as I want, I don't usually want to have this state where we feel sorry for ourselves. I take this as a celebration and, uh, uh, and I take to mask to hide that journey of knowledge as uh, something that should, and I prefer that Europeans confess to what they are doing, <laughs> which is where I disagree strongly with scholars like Valentin Moutinho, which say who say that the colonial library, the library that is produced by Europeans, what they call the colonial library, travel writing, for example. When Darwin goes to the Galapagos, when Frederick Cotton Salou travels to Africa to hunt, whose knowledge is he using? Who is leading him? How does he acquire knowledge? Just by being there and experiencing the place, traveling? Until you hear that he was led around. Until you hear that he arrived as a small boy of 17. Had to be taught by veteran old times, professionals, black professionals. A lot of these guys ended up marrying locally, tapping into rich networks, kinship networks, knowledge. Who are we talking about exactly as the author of this knowledge? I'm not talking about the compiler. Because we may be mistaking compilers for authors. So I rejected what Mutinde was, was trying to say. Anyway, since then I began to ask myself a different question. So the first three books were written as a kind of an attempt to combine history, to dissolve the disciplines. Historically grounded, yes, but bringing ethnography in, rehabilitated ethnography. Because I have my disagreements with anthropology and its investments in the colonial project. Science and technology studies, philosophy, etc., etc., all rolled into one. Now I've come to a stage where I'm asking myself, I'm here, I give lectures here, I train graduate students, undergrads. Meanwhile in Africa, the knowledge terrain is still very different. The kinds of questions that we are beginning to ask because of exposure are not being asked. Which is not to say our colleagues are doing nothing. It's simply to say that there is something missing from the business. It requires, on the one hand, I, I feel I'm asking myself, what's my legacy? Writing, how many people read my books? Maybe I could make a movie. Yeah, maybe some will watch it. These are existential questions. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I am here. I'm not there. I'm supposed to be inspiring a new generation. That's my clarion call in life, which I have self imposed. But I'm not there. What do I do about that? So my discourse is shifting towards a kind of syllabus oriented institution-oriented um, which is not that I've not been doing this. I've been doing this since I finished grad school, uh, gathering, documenting uh, indigenous knowledge, everyday knowledge uh, in villages wherever I have done research in Southern Africa, in 
is Jackson Park, and leaving it in the village to make sure that, and training young people there to collect, to continue to collect, uh, even while I'm not there. But then I began to ask myself, in my village, they only learned recently that I'm a professor. Uh, there used to be this culture of witchcraft in my village. Some of the things we have to confront as Africans, it's not to stereotype us. And I would take offense if they said, ah, oh, they believe in witchcraft. Even in New York, they are sorcerers. Mm -hmm. But the idea is a different kind of mobility, which is to say that there used to be a moment when a son or daughter's itinerations in the world, career-wise, were a closely guarded secret, uh, family to family, precisely because of the fear of them being casting a bad spell. My own father would have ended up in the United Kingdom. Didn't because my father, my grandfather, was illiterate uh, in the Western uh, knowledge of. Uh, get him a job or not. And he deferred to his uh, young brother for advice. And the young brother was saved to have a lot of his goblins and was in any case very jealous of one of his own children to prosper first. And when he brought the subject, he was told you are not going anywhere. Talk about mobilities. And so the story died there. I always chided him that day. With due respect, I think you were a coward. Why didn't you just take off and then call from London to send a letter or something? But I think I understand the milieu in which we live determines what kind of actions we take. The rationalities cannot be read backwards. They can only be read according to their terms. That's the historian. The question I'm asking myself is, what have I ever done for my own village? Successful career, professor, publisher of three books. So what? What do we each have to show for the communities where we come from? I have to ask myself that question. It's not your question. If you, you can take it if you want. I have to ask them. Because the upliftment of these communities depend on our mobilities in the world and what they mean back where we came from. Of course, some of us will choose that. So what? Big deal. Done. But the generation like this, this is Amilka Gabriel, engineer. In, he was perhaps one of Africa's first agricultural engineers in Guinea-Bissau, a Portuguese scholar got a very cushy job with the Portuguese government. The Portuguese sent him as the chief agriculture surveyor to their colonies of Cabo Verde in Guinea. Cabral goes and uses the trip as a scouting mission for what would become the guerrilla movement, peak in Guinea and Cabo Verde. And he appreciates the, how the majority are suffering goes back to Lisbon and begins a process that would lead to him leading the guerrilla movement to kick the Portuguese out of Guinea Bissau. It's not why I, 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 I recall this, it's the background. Why I recall it is he once said that for the petty bourgeois to become truly revolutionary, true revolutionaries, they have to commit suicide to their own identity and be reborn as revolutionaries, fully identified with the deepest aspirations of their own people. And for Africa and for underprivileged communities, this is the choice we may have to make. In fact, we may have no choice. But to commit suicide to a very alluring ivory tower where we have cushy jobs. And so that's the basis for the six examples, six brief examples that I'm going to give where I am now and the kind of project that I'm trying to do in my own village. 
it's a kind of institute that I'm trying to create there. Uh, and immediately what I sometimes do when I'm here is to scour the internet and go to hardware shops and uh, see you know, the, the warehouses in search of uh, tools that may be complementary to the kinds of things that uh, I'm finding on the ground that are useful. And the combination of which could actually lead to the yeah, upliftment of the lives of people. The first is, so the way I, I approach, I am not, I'm not, I, 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 I do not really usually say this is a section on gender now and I'm going to write about it. I usually include this in my analysis as a kind of sensibility to what kinds of things could lend themselves to upliftment of standards. One of them is uh, traditional beer brewing, which was a prison for women. Um, the taboo was that if you went there as a man, talk about mobility, so. if you went there as a man, the beer would become sour. <laughs> Code for get the hell out of here. This is women's territory. And among the things that I'm interested in are looking at uh, how points of intervention that could be used for what could be preserved and what could be uh, left, uh, uh, what could be changed. Based on conversations I have with the few women who are still brewing, as you know, the charismatic, uh, these big churches, uh, the T.B. Joshua's and so forth, have taken over Africa like nobody's business. And all these uh, technologies and technological processes are being just shunted to the side as a demonic, and uh, so I'm looking at that. I'm looking at uh, uh, processes of, of of preparing grain in a very organic kind of way, uh, like that. All of these, the you know, the the, the mortar and pestle, the uh, grinding stones, the winnowing baskets, and so forth, as a site where we could begin to think about an empowered process of beer brewing that is very. Beer is still very popular. Those who come from Senegal may know, may know that uh, Margaret Wade, the Senegalese uh, um, friend of mine, is, is actually been bringing Bisap, the, perhaps the national brew correct? of Senegal, to Whole Foods. So if you have time, please just sneak around Whole Foods and, and play the beer. Um, <laughs> Turning it into a global brand, which is not to say that it's simply feeding the rest of capitalism. She is actually engaging in processes that are lifting the lives of women on the ground, building an ecosystem of, uh, you know, where you don't just rise alone, you rise with most of the processes that she has long since turned to herbal medicine that her grandmother used to administer to her when she was sick. And she's telling it, she, her latest program, a, a, a product is a lip balm, which is drawn from those kinds of uh, methods. The second site, again for women, the idea with this one was that if you, uh, a man ever walked the clothes, anywhere clothes, I'm talking about Zimbabwe, Southern Africa, anyway close, the pots would crack. Even women are making their pots. Uh, don't go there, the pots would crack. Also, both for beer and women, something very interesting which I'm discussing with a friend of mine who is doing uh, a PhD on menstruation. The idea that only women who were post-menopausal or where pre-puberty could make beer or pots. Only those. Any other age group that are sexually active, please stay away. Uh, so that was, and one of the things that I, I'm, I'm interested in there is, and the idea of a, a, the menstrual period was not referred to as menstruation. It was actually, it translates to kweda kumwezi going to the moon. And there you are beginning to make your connections between mobility as time. 
the movement of time, the calculations of the seasons, astronomy, the stars, the organization of the stars, the galaxy and stuff. And how you calibrate these two pots. Very interesting. Who can make or not make pots? It's a sophisticated discourse that requires you to go beyond just this workplace into the realm of knowledge and its orderings in language. So that's what Ibra was saying yesterday, that there is deeper wall of, there is surface wall of, then there's deep, deep wall of. And to get into the realms of um, turning a wall of into a, a, a kind of a, a theory or philosophy or keywords requires a ton of work, an exhausting of the economy of all the kinds of uh, meanings that are permissible. The reverse was true of men's places. This was a men's place. Women were, were not to come here. Otherwise, the, uh, the steel that was being forged would not happen. You would fail to produce steel, or if you did, it would be weak. If you look at this space, this is the bosom of a woman. This is the vagina. And this is all other kinds of, and this is um, all other kinds of sexual organs. It's a replete, a space replete with, with sexualization. This is the bellow, which resembles the penis. The act of producing metal was a sexual act. And so perhaps that's why perhaps this man figured, well, there's a woman already here. Why should we have more women come to this I have no idea. But the idea that you could actually have this secluded space, the, true, the same could be true of the act of making pots and making beer. I am still studying to see the sexualization of the language and the tools of making it. Like, for example, the, the roles reverse. This could be the men here being pounded by this, uh, 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 what do you call it? I often confuse the mortar and person. Very interesting sexual allusions. And what my interest there is it has absolutely nothing to do with, with gender analysis. It has much more to do with what do you do with this stuff now? What do you retain? What goes? And for us, and my, view, my interest lies in not just doing or in not just critical thought. It's actually in doing. The other example that I'm looking for is the idea, MIT is, is, touts itself as a space where it's, our motto is men's at manners, which is mind and hand. And this is as mind and hand as you can get. African knowledge production is all about uh, making things, doing, learning through doing, imparting knowledge. And one of the things that I think the education system in Africa severely lacks is an applied approach. <clears throat> I often say that the problem with Africa right now is, is that you have too many critical thinkers who are not doers. <laughs> and you also have doers who are not even thinkers. To say critical thinkers would be too dignified. They are not even critical doers, they thinkers at all. Whereas I think what we need is both. I have often been reminded very quickly that it's not just Africa by the way they're talking about. Even in the United States, this is a very common problem. So the challenge for us perhaps is how do we arrive at a kind of pedagogic project which is both not just about think critical thought, which the humanities and social sciences are often good at, but also doing what would that take? is if we think in terms of this mobility project. Here you have knowledge of trees. You go to a, to a forest, there has to be a specific tree. If you cut any tree, it will crack. Or it is too, if you, the more you keep pounding, the more it sinks until there's nothing. 
for it just splits. So you need the right kind of you need the right kind of knowledge on where to cut. If you cut on the northern side and the, the southern side, it will rot. A tree should only be cut where the sun rises and sets. Why? To allow for the sun to perform its healing on the wound that you're causing. And to enable the stuff to regrow. At a certain angle, you don't just cut and you're done. That knowledge is what this father is imparting to his son. Then you cut. There is no, people would often stress about, oh, is art design? Of course. Before this uh, meticulous planning of drawings and stuff, you know, the best way you could design was to be artistic. There is no disagreement there. This is art and design folded into one, happening at the same time. Same time. And then finished product. And then you take it to your mom. As a rule, your mom did not just Oh, thank you, put it over there. She would be ululating, dancing, you know, reciting your, 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 your ancestral praise poetry from your greatest ancestor, the founding ancestor, to the last. From your, your, your greatest female ancestor to the last. A communication of this great act of craft, craftsmanship so that it's heard not only by those that are living, but by those ancestors long departed who are after all not dead but have through the process of a, a, a purification been brought are back looking after the living that's the cosmos that we are talking about two final uh, uh, points this one is less a, a, a spiritual but equally important. If you are looking for a space where you have this nestedness and this messiness of gender analysis and how we are using, particularly in development discourse, right now, as you know, there is a lot of conversation that if you empower women, you have empowered Africa. Where do you do that? How do you avoid conflict around that? One way is to look at these grain preservation uh, devices. It falls in the realm of post-harvest technologies. What do you do with grain when it's all harvested? Today, all we simply do is we take these chemicals, which are harmful. We are told at the time that they are okay. They are harmless until they are harmful. So what, it was the role of the father and sons to construct the hut. It was not the role of the father and sons to design the interior of this. This role fell to women. Because they, once it's built, except if you are a child who is being sent in there to get grain, this was completely a space for women's management. The number one manager of food security, and to which we may add energy security, on in the homestead were women and girls. So that's an aside to what I'm trying to say is the, so this, this is the granary, separated into different uh, spaces according to which grains would be tapped into first, which ones would come next, and which one would be last. Once that was done, you construct the hut, you seal the entrance. And when you seal the entrance, the idea was no weevils would enter and devour the grain because there was no air to breathe. They would die. And if you are thinking of African modes of science, it's one instantiation of African modes of science. There are no ifs or buts there. The principle was simple. Nothing would survive in there, especially if it would at first be fumigated with smoke or fire so that it's completely uh, devoid of any life. And then everything was just sealed. 
a very interesting place. Or the same process, you dig a hole underneath in the ground, and then you, you put clay all around, and then you fire it. You put grain, and you put another layer here, maybe a stone, a big stone, and you seal. And then you build a hut over it. Or perhaps put a, 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 a god a, a pen where you know this coral where the gods would actually uh, be, be, be corralled at night. Done. Final example is my favorite, which prompted this project. How is it the sun, who are often called the Bushmen, could combine? the juice from this beetle or it's a, 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 a the worm that comes of this the, the chrysalis with this tree rubber tree called mkoni and this psychedelic or this trapdoor spider which by the way is an interesting animal that's why i like to, to deal with insect mobilities it, it traps its uh, a quarry by simply uh, you know, of, uh, cre you know, creating this structure, and then it hides here. <laughs> and then the moment that uh, the 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 officious uh, locust or something tries to come in, <laughs> then it closes. <laughs> How on earth did they know that these elements would constitute a potent poison when put together? I have no idea. And moreover, a biodegradable poison that will kill but will not be harmless to, to eat when you consume the meat. And so it has triggered a whole search now for the project began as a kind of African chemistry project, but has long since veered towards African modes of science. I simply call it science within African totem. So and that's the psychedelic that I was talking about. We call it in Zepet. Uh, as children, we used to play around with it when we were out heading cattle. Again, it's those mobilities that inspire me. If you pluck the leaf here, it has a fiber which is elastic. And if you continue to roll it on your head, and one leaf after the other, you produce a thick mass which exactly resembles you know, a spider's web. And then if you roll it like that, you have a bamboo. We used to love doing this. This one was interesting because it was the most beautiful flower you would get in the farm. But we were not interested in the flowers. What we were interested in round about August, the month that was born, the windy month, was this one. Uh, so after it blooms and it dries, it produces this multi spike ball which as the, ray, as, as the wind sweeps, it just continues to go. And you could follow it for kilometers. It would just continue going and going and going and going. And we would compete who would, you know, be the, uh, who would go furthest, who would bet something. Anyway, the last thing I'll say is this, that this was our abacus, or our, as they say these days, algorithm. It's where you first learned how to count. Like this. And then you're done. If you get to the top first, you have one. It's how we first learned how to count. And that method you then abstract it to trees with these leaves which have many leaflets on any given um, what do you call it? Sub I don't know what they call it. But, and, and the more you, the, the more leaf, leaf, sub leaves, only a leaf, you could count, the more you became proficient in the arts of counting. So it has triggered in me the search for African modes of mathematics. Anyway, why am I doing this? Because a lot of this knowledge is what sustains people when they have lost, lost jobs in town or failed to get work in town, they always go back to the rural areas 
where they defeat is not a piece in order to help a little. <coughs> Why not develop it? Because since our ancestors, we often freeze and fossilize this knowledge and call it indigenous knowledge. But if our ancestors had, had a gift of long life, surely don't tell me that uh, they would still be uh, using the exact same methods. This knowledge would be further ahead. We have never domesticated any new grains since the last ones we found. And yet our ancestors over millennia admitted they were able to domesticate many crop varieties. I put it down to this that we have a culture that this DA Masolo called self-mortification. The idea that simply because it's Indian or African, uh, it's, 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 it's a, a, a Puerto Rican, therefore it is a inferior. What is real knowledge must come from the United States, from Europe, etc. etc. I don't think that culture of modification helps, and by our election, we promote it. The vision that I have, which I have committed myself as a leader, is to create sites where we can begin to think critically about these things with students. Um, it's built on a, a, a kind of field class model where professors, students, and communities, industry, government, non-governmental organizations, and everybody else comes together. There are monies that are there for whether it's a social responsibility, corporate social responsibility. But I'm looking further beyond that. I'm looking at possibilities of um, companies that could actually have in product development in Zimbabwe uh, as a starting point. I am not uh, going to pretend that this is purely for academic knowledge for the sake of knowing. In my own self-conceited way, I just believe that the role of the academic in Africa is anywhere other than the ivory tower. It's too much of a risk. We went to school for free. And we came here, a system that did not contribute to the grants that we, the loans, the grants that we advanced to us were loans from the IMF and World Bank and from the countries where we now offer our service. Surely we have to have a conscience to say at some given point we need to really take, uh, you know, this task. Uh, at hand and deal with it uh, as a personal uh, payback. Thank you.